Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's FTMA webinar on converting steel beams to timber beams in residential construction. My name's Alistair Woodard, and I'm the FWPA's National Residential Construction and Fitout Manager, and I'll be your MC for today's webinar. This is actually the fourth uh, webinar in the FTMA webinar series. The previous three webinars have all concentrated on frame and truss opportunities and lightweight mid-rise construction, more for apartment, hotel and office type buildings. And if you've missed any of these webinars, you can still see them as the wall of webinars are recorded each week and you can access these through the FTMA website. Three other great webinars are planned for September uh, on Wednesday the 9th, one on sales training, Wednesday the 16th, uh, one on tips to secure funding. And then on Wednesday, the 23rd of September, I'll actually be back to talk about uh, some work we've done recently, speaking with um, the top 100 volume builders nationally and their views on timber framing. It was interesting with that, um, that exercise, one thing I heard quite regularly in my interviews uh, with these volume builders is that they'd much rather use timber structural beams on their jobs rather than steel, wherever they possibly could. With steel beams, there's lots of headaches, Steel beams require additional pro product coordination. They mean another trade to manage on site. There's also crane coordination and crane costs and possibly some downtime to workflow. Whereas with timber, beams were generally lighter, easier to fit, usually no cranes were required. And it was also easier because you can just triple grip connect to them. So really most builders would clearly prefer timber structural beams to steel. And importantly, this now means new opportunities for frame and truss fabricators in terms of supplying these things. And that's where we, uh, why we're here today to discuss at today's webinar, converting steel beams to timber. And we have two industry experts to assist here, who uh, I'll introduce shortly. Um, I just want to uh, let you know that uh, if you want to interact with people throughout today's webinar, you can either use the chat button down the bottom, just click all panelists and attendees, if you want to uh, chat between one another. But most importantly, at the end of the session, after Stefan and Tim have uh, both spoken, we'll have a Q&A session. And um, if you can see the button down there, you just need to click on the, the um, box will come up and you just type your questions in. Look, type them in as we go, that makes it easier. And, uh, and pe people like the questions, um, they can also actually acknowledge that and that prioritizes the questions to be answered at the end. But an important part of these webinars is interacting with the audience. So please use that Q&A button as we move along. So I'd just like to introduce our two presenters today and um, they'll be sort of presenting in unison off the, off the similar presentation. Firstly, we'll start with uh, Stefan Gerber, who's the engineering manager and sales manager at Glulam Timber at Hind Timber. Beginning his career in the European tradition with an apprenticeship in joinery, followed by an engineering degree, his passion for timber has taken him all the way from Switzerland to Australia. He has worked with Henkel, Hilti, the Wood Solutions Midrise team, and since 2019 has been with Hind Timber as engineering and sales manager for the Glulam division. Following um, Stefan, Tim Rossiter will uh, then speak and Tim really needs no introduction to this audience, having been with the frame and trust sector and with MyTech since 1997. Over those 23 years, Tim has held the roles of chief engineer, state manager of New South Wales and Western Australia, and today is MyTech's general manager for building solutions in the Asia Pacific region. So both speakers have an enormous experience and are very well qualified to speak on, on, this, uh, on today's topic. So I'm just going to unshare my screen now and then uh, allow Stefan to share his and start up. Afsal, if you're on at the moment, um, you might need to just, uh, yeah, okay, that's good, Stefan. Okay. I'm on. Yep, we can see. Beautiful. Thank you very much, Alastair, and uh, welcome everybody, and thank you for joining us in this webinar today on this topic of converting steel beams to timber solutions. As Alastair said, I'll be doing the first part of this presentation, and uh, Tim Rossiter from MyTech will follow with the second part. A really big thank you goes to Afsal Lafir from Maya Timber, because he's been putting uh, the case studies together for me um, and for this presentation. Afsal is in the audience, as uh, Alastair said, and he'll be able to um, assist with Q&A later after this presentation. So let's get started with um, the content. So is that slide switching, Alastair? Yep, all good. So in my part of the Prezi, um, I will be um, 
um, we'll be looking at why do we actually want to convert steel to timber? Which timber products are best suited to replace steel beams? We will look briefly at Glulam and LVL as the most likely candidates there. After that, we'll go straight into a couple of practical examples where we will be looking at converting steel, steel beams to a roof truss, parallel core truss, We'll be looking at a steel portal frame, converting that to a uh, timber portal frame. And um, I will finish then um, on a example of a simple beam substitution. So first of all, why are we wanting to convert steel beams to timber? Well, it fits better in with the timber frame construction, of course. Timber goes well with timber. You, the frame and truss fabricators, can be the one-stop shop provider and by doing that, add value to your business. The design part of it is fully integrated in frame and truss industry software and um, there is therefore no need to get other steel uh, or get the steel beams designed by other engineers. And timber, of course, it, it is uh, much more workable, it's much lighter, it is readily available. Engineered wood products like LVL and Clulam are readily available and will make um, overall for a more cost-effective uh, solution, we believe. So let's look quickly into those most suitable timber products, starting with Clulam. Clulam is offered in standard stress grades um, such as GL17 and GL13, um, just as an example. These are uh, specified in AS1720.1, the timber design code. Um, GL17 is the strongest pine beam available, I believe, uh, globally. GL13 um, is a lower grade product which will do the job for many applications. There are also hardwood options for um, you know, where high stiffness, like a GL21 high stiffness and or appearance is key. Uh, and these beams are, are also available through Australian manufacturers. Beams are also available either straight or cambered. Um, on the cambered, um, I will follow up in a separate slide just after this one, just to give you a bit of a uh, an idea what uh, what that does. There are also proprietary glue line products like LGL and LGL Plus from Hind Timber available. Uh, why are these proprietary? That's because their specific specific stress grades are um, are not standardized, so they're not listed um, as GL grades in the AES uh, seventeen twenty point one code. In terms of appearance, uh, Glulam comes in three different appearance grades to cater for exposed and concealed applications. Appearance grade A, um, just to give you a bit more detail on those, is a patched and sanded finish. B is dressed and paint ready. And C is the industrial uh, grade, which would be typically used in a uh, concealed application. Of course, it is also uh, more um, uh, it's all also more cost effective. Just uh, briefly on the densities uh, of the of glue lamp timber and um, density ranges around about between 550 and 700 kilograms per cubic meter, depending on the resource radiata pine, more on the lower end um, and southern pine or slash pine from the Queensland uh, uh, plantations um, are at the higher end of the spectrum. Density, therefore, is compared to a, a steel steel beam, it's, it's about 12 times lower than steel. So I've mentioned cambered beams being available regarding the cambered option. What does cambering actually mean? It is a slight upward curve or arch uh, which is introduced into the beam during manufacturing. The pre-camber radius is 600 meters. So that makes um, for, let's say, a six meter long beam that results in a 7.5 millimeter camber 
or arch at the center of the, the beam. Once installed, the beam will be straight under dead load. Dead load uh, is the, the load that cannot be moved. Cambered um, beams, therefore, uh, outperform straight beams in terms of deflection, which means that often a cambered beam comes in a smaller si section size. Um, of course, to get the benefits of a cambered beam, it has to be um, installed the right way up with the arch upwards. So once the dead load is on, the beam is straight. And for that purpose, all manufacturers mark their beams with a, with a, with a stamp to show which way is up. Clulam is available in a range of widths and depths as shown in this table. Here I've highlighted the pine beams as they are the most, uh, you know, most typically used in residential construction. Uh, for the common pine beam, uh, width ranges from 44, a narrow 44 to 300, and depth ranges from 90 to 1200, that is 1 1.2 meters depth. Um, in terms of length, um, I can tell you what we do at Hein Timber, we manufacture up to 16.8 meters. Uh, other manufacturers may produce shorter or longer beams also. Now um, to another uh, engineered wood product that uh, suits uh, LVL, LVL is similarly suited to replace steel beams. For this product, stress, stress grades are all specified by the manufacturer as they are not standardized. Most common grades are E13 and E14, but the global E value ranges from nine to 19. LVL is a very cost-effective product and it is made uh, from sustainable timber resource and it's available in straight and long lengths. Now we're going straight into the uh, practical examples, as I mentioned, um, provided by AFSAL. Um, but before I get into it, I, I should also mention here that um, in some cases, solid song timber members may be suitable also. F-17s, F-27s. However, I'd suggest that engineered work products like Clulam and LVL are, because they're more homogeneous in terms of stiffness and strength properties, and they're also more dimensionally stable um, because of the, the gluing process and the, the removal of, of uh, defects, I think they are, um, they are better suited. So now let's get into some, um, some case studies here. Um, starting with the first one. So in this first case study, looking at a, a residential, typical residential home um, where um, steel beams um, that support the upper floor structure and as well as roof, but also uh, the lower level roof um, were replaced by timber trusses. In this slide, you can see the steel beams. Um, there are one, two, three, four, uh, four beams, five beams, um, ranging from UB150 in size to up to a UB250, the big one there um, stretching across the width of the building. These are the beams that we are replacing in this case with uh, roof uh, trusses. And you can see here, um, this is the converted layout showing the roof trusses replacing the steel beams. You can see that in this example, uh, there is plenty of depth available to allow for these trusses. Here is the comparison of cost, weight, and also stiffness to, ratio, to weight ratio, which is typically high for trusses due to their shape. These trusses, um, they came in two parts and were assembled um, um, on site. So be, because they come in two parts, it makes it um, obviously lighter each part of them and they're easy to lift into position and to be assembled then uh, uh, on site. 
overall, the cost of the trusses is significantly lower, as you can see in this comparative pricing. So takeaways from this first example with roof trusses. Um, cost is reduced by approximately 30, 35%, which is significant. Due to the lighter nature of the elements, the installation is safer. There is no need for cranes or special steel erectors or welders on site. So overall, the benefit to the frame and truss fabricator is the ability to add value by offering a one-stop shop solution. Next example. This is um, a case study where depth again allows for a deeper truss to replace a big UB360 steel beam. The 720 millimeter deep parallel cord truss is double the depth of the steel beam. So obviously we, we, we need that depth to be available for this to work. You can see in this uh, drawing, the truss is laterally restrained by the floor and roof trusses, uh, which, are, uh, which it is supporting. Again, weight and cost savings are big in this example. You can see here, um, both being appro approximately I would say half of that of the steel beam solution. The key takeaways of this conversion, cost is reduced by a massive 50%. Safety again and installation efficiency are increased greatly due to the lower weight. Again, also the overarching benefit to the frame and truss Fabricator here is the ability to add value by offering a one-stop shop solution to the customer. Example number three, looking at a, a portal frame. Um, so this third case study uh, we're showing you here is the conversion of a steel, uh, a steel um, portal frame using 180 steel channel system um, and being converted to a two-ply through 300 by 45 LVL solution. Um, you can see the, yeah, the columns are 300 wide uh, because the, the actual um, available wall width was 300 millimeters in this case. Benefits for a timber versus steel portals lie again mostly in the weight advantage, resulting in ease of installation by the carpenter on site. No other uh, contractors uh, needed to come onto site, which uh, as well is obviously delivering a cost saving. This is just one other example of uh, such a timber portal frame solution showing a different um, proprietary system. So there are actually um, a couple of uh, systems to make these timber photo frames out there in the market you can choose from. Takeaways for the portal frame conversion. Ease of installation due to the reduced weight again, significant overall, overall cost reduction and um, a good one here also is we can avoid to the additional timber framing that is needed around a steel portal. So that's again would, would add a cost saving as well. Now the straight conversion um, from a steel beam to a, um, to a timber beam as a last case study here. Uh, direct substituting um, 250 UB and a 230 PFC in a six meter single span application. Um, in the strongest pine glue lamp grade, GL17, this would require either a 395 by 85 or a 460 by 65 straight, uh, straight beam. Another option would be 
the 525 by 75 LVL E13. Now you can see here, here the note on the camber. So now um, by using a cambered glue lamp uh, beam, the long-term deflection is significantly lower than for all the other options, including steel, which would enable us to actually reduce the section size if we wanted to just um, uh, to achieve exactly the same deflection. Um, so you can see here the deflection um, for the straight ones is 9.7 and 8 millimeters. For um, if that was a cambered beam on the six meters, we would um, we would have a camber of 7.5 mil, which comes off the 9, 7, and 8 millimeters, leaving us with 2.2 and 0 0.5 uh, millimeter deflection respectively. And then uh, we we definitely outperform all the other options here, which we probably would go then to a smaller section size to, to match those other ones. So that, that is my last example. At this point, I will uh, unshare my screen and um, Tim Rossiter will, will continue. Jim, unmute your microphone. I was just saying, I'm on mute, so no one can hear what I'm saying. Thank you, Alistair. Okay, so just picking up from where, uh, where Stefan has left off, um, I want to pick up this theme of converting timber from converting steel beams into timber beams. But rather than do it by individual case studies, what I thought I'd do instead was to try and find you the best way to proceed to identify the ideal spot to, to target. Um, the reality is that almost everything is possible. It's just the cost that matters and how much effort you have to put in to achieve it. So almost every steel beam you could replace somehow with timber trusses or timber beams. Um, there are limitations around geometry sometimes. We'll cover those. But ideally, you should be able to look at a, a layout from an engineer, have a look at the steel beams that have been nominated, have a, a, an image in your mind as to how those beams fit in within the structure, and make some very quick determinations about whether it's worth your effort in going to try and convert some of those beams over. So I thought the best thing to give you this afternoon would have been some, some little rules of thumb, some, some comparisons that you can use to flag that time when you should make the effort to have a crack at changing a beam over. The reality is that most engineers, not us timber guys obviously, but most engineers in general practice are very, very comfortable with steel. So that will often be their default position. We're slowly educating them but certainly uh, your garden variety GP style residential engineer is very, very comfortable in, in steel land. So they'll, they'll tend to default to that and they'll do, tend to default to one solution. So if they start with steel, they'll continue with steel. If they start with timber, they'll continue with timber. Uh, the reality for most structures as we're learning around the mid-rise applications and others is that hybrid is often a better way to go. Use the right product in the right position. So this is gonna give you a little bit of a feel uh, as to when you should be making the, the first question about, oh, shall I convert that to a timber beam? Can I, can I get some traction on this or should I not really bother? So let's start with some really simple stuff. Now, these are, these are just my rules of thumb. They're not hard and fast. I'm not saying that once you get to um, 5.01 millimetres that you're in a problem. But if you glance at a, a layout and you're seeing beams that have been drawn in steel that are shorter than three metres long, that's a highly likely candidate to go, oh, I wonder what I could do for that in timber. Between three and five metres long, that's okay. Once you get past that, timber's deflection issues start to come into play. Stefan's right, we, we can use cambered beams to resolve some of those problems. Or of course, you can start going to trusses as we saw in, in the earlier examples. This is my thrust at the moment is doing a, a straight beam for beam conversion. And again, when you do go to the trusses, obviously you're gonna have some more work to do, some more design work to do, some more time to spend, some more consulting to do. Uh, you may need some alterations to the way in which the builder works the company you work with, et cetera. So often a beam to beam conversion is much easily, much more easily accepted by those on site. Here's another way of looking at it. Now I've drawn up a table 
uh, which you'll be able to get, I'm assuming, Alistair and Kirsten will make these uh, slides available later. So feel free to delve into this at, in your own time. But I've put together a rough table based on straight blue lambs, um, not cambered, because the maths is a bit harder. And when I bundled together the F27 and F17, they're also grouped with the mid-capacity LVL. So the reality is they're about the same stiffness the section sizes, obviously, you can get an LVL are going to be much larger. I'm also conscious that LVL comes in widths other than 70 and 90. So feel free, again, take a little bit of license on here. Also take a bit of license on what I've determined to be what's a great, okay, and average and poor circumstance. To my mind, anything less than 290 could even be a solid. So that's a great place to start. Anything in the 250, 400 range, you have much less problems with interacting with the structure. So again, a, a, an okay place to be playing. When you get into the, the deeper members, four to 500, there are other elements that, come, that start to come into play. And once you get over about 500, then even more issues come to play around how it fits into the geometry. So just take a, a bit of a time to see how that graph works. Note that the first steel sections are your UB sections and the second grouping are the PFCs. Now, yes, there are more PFCs that would fit into that list, uh, and there are plenty more UBs. Uh, the, the numbers I've chosen are about the mid-level ones. So for those that aren't aware, the, the last number in a UB nomination is its mass in kilograms per metre. So the, the bigger the last number, the heavier and stiffer the beam's going to be. So you can get 310 UBs up to 50s and 55s. You can get 150 UB 18s, et cetera, et cetera. So this was just to give you a sample. And it doesn't mean that as soon as you drop into the yellow box, it's no good, don't play. What it means is if you're clearly in the green box, that's great, go and have a chat. If you're in the yellow zone or near to the yellow zone, ask a few more questions. If you're in the, if you're in the glue lamb land, perhaps start thinking about a, a, a cambered one. If you find yourself in the red section, again, it doesn't mean don't do it. It just means it'll be a little bit harder for you to make that work. And you'll see that once you get to the deeper PFCs, your glue lambs come to play and your LVLs sort of drop out. Again, nothing is set in concrete, but this is just to give you a guide. So feel free to, to take that away. And next time you've got a plan that's been provided to you by a builder which has beams nominated on it, do a quick eyeball. See how many of those beams you think you might be able to change over, given the opportunity. The reality is that often we can solve problems in broad terms, but it's the, the details that bring us unstuck. And that works in two ways. So there are positives and there are negatives. So the way in which our beams interact with the building needs to be borne into, a, into consideration when you're also trying to work out which beams should be nominated as potential candidates for swap out and which beams you should just simply stay away from. So I'm gonna run through uh, some of the, the changes that occur, some of the, uh, the areas to watch out for. Um, obviously how the beam is supported and how it's connected are highly important to how the consideration will be taken. And there are other ramifications around the building itself. What's the beam supporting? How does it fit in amongst the structure? Uh, one thing I will say is that if you're supporting brickwork, so imagine you've got a, a large beam potentially over a, a lower family room that's taking your upper story uh, building and that's a brick veneer upper story. Timber's not a good friend with brickwork. Uh, if that was a situation, I'm thinking that a steel beam with a welded flange across the base of it is by far the best circumstance because you end up with the beam to take the frame and the, the flange that welds out across the bottom or the plate that welds across the bottom takes the brickwork. Uh, other things to bear in mind around uh, your cambered beams. Again, if you're using a cambered beam, Stefan's perfectly correct. You can't put the camber up. And I'm gonna highlight that again. Put the camber up. For those on the, on the call, I'm sure at least half of you have come to circumstances in the past where you found issues on site that were a deflected beam over a garage that was put with very clearly this side up on the bottom. This side up is there for a reason. Continue to educate your carpenters. Um, that's why that has to be done that way. Talk to Stefan and other glue lamb providers and some of the EWP guys. They've all been out on site and it's very easy to work out what the deflection problem is. You put the curve down, you've already started the wrong way. But when you do put the curve up, as Stefan said, once the dead load comes on, you end up back at flat or within the deflection limitations of that beam. So you might end up a couple of mils down below flat. Now that's great when it's finished, but the process has to be of getting that beam into position. 
So flexible timber framing above it, that works perfectly. Brickwork, not so much, not so friendly to a little bit of movement to get things in the right position. So again, another reason, if you're supporting brickwork, stick with the steel beam. We'll talk a little bit about some of the other ramifications as we go through. End supports. One of the great positives is that steel engineers use steel columns. Generally, if they put a steel beam in, when it hits the wall, they'll put a steel column. If you're able to convert the, timber, the steel beam to a timber beam, you can usually replace the steel column with a timber post. In reality, you can replace the steel column under a steel beam with a timber post in many cases as well. It's just that most people on site are comfortable putting a steel beam on top of a cap of a steel column and they have a little bit of an aversion to placing a steel beam on top of a, a timber cluster of, uh, of studs which is not real, it should be no problem doing it. It's just, there's just this internal resistance to doing it. So in this example, uh, and I should say from the outset, uh, there was a, a reference to Steve Dais from Wesbeam right at the beginning that I should um, recognize that Steve gave me a hand with a, a number of examples that he's come across over the years that I could just pop up on screen quickly. So in this example here, you'll see that that steel beam across the middle, um, B8, uh, B6 rather, has been changed into a 295 glue lamp, fits nicely within the floor system. And the net result was that the two columns that were 90, uh, sorry, 89 by 89 square hollow sections got swapped out to timber columns. Win-win, you get timber in both places. Again, positives in the end support around timber being supported by steel, that's easy. Welding a cleat on a piece of steel to take a timber beam coming in isn't hard. Slight notching of a beam to sit, a timber beam to sit inside a uh, a C channel or inside the side of an I beam, also easy to do. So connecting timber to steel isn't a difficulty. So that's a that's a tick if you have that circumstance. The roof plane interaction, that can be in your favour or not. Depends on the pitch, depends on the spans, etc, etc. Truss is a great option, uh, as you saw earlier. We, we can do a truss and the, you've dealt with the roof plane straight away. When you start getting deeper and deeper beams though, a couple of things come into play. One is the ability for someone to cut a straight long line and the, um, the suitability brackets that I've used there of good, uh, sorry, great, okay, average and poor are more around my skill set at cutting a straight line with a circular saw. Um, even with a straight edge, 400 millimetre longs are getting right up there. If you'd ask me to cut a straight line at an angle for 600 millimetres, you need someone else to do it rather than a poor engineer. But the other reality is that around the heel, or the, the toe support, if you like, down here, the depth of timber available to resist that reaction at that point, the shearing across that tip, um, becomes a, an issue that you may have to have some engineering support on. So if you get a steep beam, you get into some depth at that point with a very shallow cut like I've drawn, you end up with not much timber here to resist that bearing point. The reality is the beam could still quite happily work. You might just need a couple of, um, pieces of advice from your beam supplier or your, uh, your timber engineer. Again, a rough guide. This is just my guide about when you should be thinking about pitches versus beam depth and what's a good place to be and what's a poor place to be. So take that with a grain of salt, apply your own ability to cut straight lines to it if you like. But the reality is once you're over about a 500 millimeter high beam, dealing with this problem here becomes a bit tricky because you're gonna end up with um, nearly 750 into the building before you've reached the full height. So that's the thing to bear in mind in terms of its interaction with the building. There's a few negatives about uh, internal interactions as well. Beam to beam, timber to steel is great. Steel to timber, not so great. It's not impossible. Again, I said before, nothing's impossible, it just costs more money. You can attach a steel beam to a timber beam. I've seen it done quite often with end plates and bolts. And that is quite suitable and quite well done. The reality in most residential construction in Australia, people are still not comfortable doing it. You've got to convince somebody who would much rather just weld the two beams together to put an end plate on, put the bolts in the right position, uh, and then have someone hold it in position while it's bolted to the beam. So it's not impossible. It's just not a great candidate. So in this particular example, we've got our, a little B8 across here. Perfect candidate. The size of the beam was about a 200. It was only spanning across a hallway, so it was only about 1200 long. So a great candidate to be a timber beam. But the reality is in the floor plan, there's a very large beam B6 
across here, which is picking up other beams to take the upper floor. That beam has no choice, that has to be steel. The spans that it's carrying and the span that is itself fitting within the floor system needs to be a decent steel beam. So the sight reality of saying, I've got a great big 300 UB attached to my useful piece of timber becomes an issue at this point. And it's not about being impossible, it's just about making sure that what you're recommending people to do on site, they're quite happy to do, and they get a positive experience that they'll report on the next time as being functional. What is highly likely though, columns here. So there's a potential here again, to put a timber post cluster in this corner to pick up this beam. Again, you're gonna have engineers who specify steel under steel. The reality is you can put timber in those corners if you can get um, a bit of a design check done on it. It's usually not that difficult to do. But again, it comes down to that side experience of people like steel that attach to steel and timber to attach to timber. So be aware of that sort of thing. Another great candidate is to be able to hide beams. So when you have the room available, a deep beam is not a problem. If you're not anywhere near a roof space, so in this particular example, we have a, a lower story uh, with a beam going across the garage. You can zoomed in here, you can see this beam shooting across the garage, picking up the upper floor. It cantilevers out, or it doesn't cantilever, it goes and gets picked up by a post out on the side to pick up the alfresco, because the, the upper story actually pokes out over here. You'll notice, obviously, SHS, 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 steel means steel. So you, your garden variety engineer is gonna specify steel posts and steel columns underneath steel beams. In this instance, cladded above, still a tile roof, but cladded above, we're able to get away with a 500 deep beam. So 495 GL 17 cambered, right? So great big blue lamp beam across here, no issues with heels, no issues with uh, brickwork above, great candidate. So we can put that beam in the wall. When you get into the, the, um, the step out area over here, you can drop that down into a smaller 300 deep beam. Also a great solution. Be a little bit careful though. Make sure you do coordinate with your frame detailer to make sure that the fact that you've gone from a 500 beam deep beam to a 300 deep beam in this area is accounted for in the frame and that the beams are accounted for in the frame so that they are manufactured the right height. One of the great things about doing this sort of work as a fabricator is that you have the power to, to make those changes and make those alterations, knowing that what you're supplying will fit because you're supplying both products. One of the great things about supplying timber beams is that the supply chain is limited to one, you. Things arrive on time, they arrive that are integrated, it functions properly because you're not jumping between supplies. So that brings me pretty much to the end of where I'm up to, which is gonna hopefully you have a lot of questions to go, but just in summary, if you're not supporting brickwork, lots of ifs. If there's depth and it fits inside the building, then do look at putting solid timber in or LVL or glue lamb, trusses or timber portals. There'll be more portals developing in the marketplace as more people get into this space as well. The ability for the frame and truss supplier to supply more of the solution is a testament to our longevity in the industry and it will continue to grow. And you'll find that already that is a different feeling in each different state. Uh, for example, in Western Australia, where they're doing a fair bit of conventional framing, there's been a move over the years recently, those 10 years or so, to move steel beams into LVL beams because it's possible. Um, you'll find that some of the areas that are still in stick material, uh, where it's a, a wall frame is cut on site. Generally, the engineering gets done by a, a local engineer and often that becomes a steel solution. So it depends a bit on the market that you're in, but feel free to start pushing the boundaries. Remember that the selling point for you guys to the market is that when you're on site and you're handling steel versus when you're on site and handling timber is as Alistair reported, the trades on site, the builder on site knows that it's gonna be a much easier job if they're working with timber as opposed to trying to interact with steel. Uh, you have a steel beam, you're gonna need to pack on top of it. You're gonna need to pack around it so that you can get the windows to fit or the wall framing to work. If you need to connect something in timber to steel, it means you need to either bolt a packer on, screw a packer on, weld a cleat on. There's all this extra stuff to be done. You wanna attach timber to timber. There are plenty of simple brackets, screws, bolts, etc., that do that quite readily that the trade is comfortable doing. 
you take a steel beam out to site that has to attach onto a steel column and it's to be done by welding. Okay, you now you need a hot trade. You need a welder out there. He has to get there at the right time. Make sure his weld doesn't interfere with the steel, uh, sorry, with the timber. Make sure he puts it in the right spot because adjusting it later is really hard. So you can have cheaper, safer, easy to install options just by using a timber instead of a steel solution for these structural elements. It's not going to be every solution, but it's certainly more prevalent than I think, uh, sorry, it could be more prevalent than it currently is. And as I said before, as part of the frame and truss package for the builder, they're going to get a, a one-stop supply chain. They know that the, when the frames arrive out on site, soon to follow will be the beams. They don't have to guess or hope or order the steel themselves because you're in control of it. So you, the family trust plant, get to save your builder time and money and you increase your own income because when you sell something, you put your own margin on it. So everybody's a winner. If you get into those gray areas or in any of the, the green or orange areas, feel free to reach out to your nail plate supply, your EWP, EWP suppliers. Most of you have access to software that designs timber beams now. Uh, there are engineers and all those companies that can assist with specific circumstances. If you have a beam on a beam or a truss to a beam to a beam that isn't catered for in your standard uh, design package, contact the engineering staff. You'll find the software these days is now able to do even more um, full house interaction of loads so that you're getting beams designed within your software automatically without having to engage an engineer if you don't need to. So that's, uh, that's enough from me. Hopefully that's given you enough leads and shortcuts that you can apply in your own business and the next time you get a plan or the last time you got a plan that came through your desk have a glance at it have a look at the steel pull up the little table and go hey i can change that beam there's a beam here i could muck around with don't be afraid of only changing two of five beams change whatever you can get let's change the industry over from being steel default to being timber default and steel's the oddity thanks alistair i'll drop that back to you no problems thanks tim that was great the, if you want to share your screen and I'll yep. just put my Q&A out. So people in the audience, of uh, which we have uh, around 50, so we've had a, got a good audience today, which we really appreciate. Um, we are keen to get um, some of your Q&A uh, questions, so we do want to answer those. And uh, I'm going to ask, ask Afsal Lafir also to, uh, to join us as just part of this discussion. So please start using the Q&A button down the bottom and type some questions in and we can get a a bit of discussion happening around this really important topic. Um, I would just, we'll just say um, um, it was really interesting with the work we've done with uh, talking to the volume builders, which we did nationally, just some of the uh, the feedback we got. Afsal, you can join up too if you like, just um, unmute your video and unmute your, uh, unmute your, um, your, your microphone. Um, but um, I mean, housing has changed, you know, the last 20 years, uh, um, you know, things have got different. Houses have got a lot bigger. Um, you know, interestingly, um, you know, people want two-storey houses now. That's totally open plan on the ground floor. So 20 years ago, we could build a house, you know, under the uh, AS 1684. Pretty much anyone could pull the sizes out of that, you know, whether it was the builder doing it, the council doing it. Um, you know, that we had sort of good uh, load lines all the way to the ground. You know, houses were pretty standard. Um, but, um, yeah, these days... Uh, as I say, the house has changed. They've got bigger, um, two storeys, built right out the boundaries, um, big open plan. You've got the engineer more involved now. There's more litigation. The building surveyor doesn't want to make any um, you know, decisions himself. He wants to hand it off to the engineer. But that, that, that's causing us a few problems. But, but definitely in the residential sector, there, there are a number of steel beams, I reckon, that uh, pop up all the time that we can definitely do something about. And when we might chat about that as a, with the panel shortly, but um, you know, definitely uh, garages. You know, there's two steel beams inevitably that go in that. The one that goes across the front of the garage that supports the brickwork. As Tim said, that's generally better done in steel because it, you've got the flexion issues there. You don't want the brickwork cracking. But sometimes that's set back again to hold up the upper level. If that's set back, it's definitely a good candidate for timber. And the run, the one that runs from the front to the back is definitely a good candidate for timber, whether that's a timber beam or simply building a truss into the wall. So I think there are some sort of standard um, solutions that we need to look at. Now, I still haven't seen any questions, audience, so please add some at the moment, but I just wouldn't mind having a little bit of a discussion on some of these. Actually, there is one there, um, um, Alistair. Is there? I can't see it on my screen. So it's from Christine um, Briggs in the okay. chat. It says, 
Is there a sweet spot for hybrid species beams with a softwood core and hardwood outer? What's the market and required properties for this? Good okay. question. Tell me the properties, I'll tell you where it fits. That's one of those, yeah, it swings, it's a, it's a, I need to know the answer before I can know the answer. Um, from that little graph that I popped up before, those are softwood glue lambs um, and the LVLs are, and F27s are equivalent in hardwoods. You'll find that the section properties between them aren't that much different in terms of their shape, but it's the, stiff that, the, the stiffness that makes a difference. So there will be a market for a, a, um, a hardwood beam. It will take you beyond the LV, uh, sorry, beyond the glue lambs that exist now. So it, it'll grow those green zones a little bit further. You have to tell me how much stiffer you're going to make it before I can tell you the answer as to what the, what it's going to be. But the reality is by putting your um, your hardwood on the outside flanges, you get a, a slightly stiffer product than when you have your softwood on the inside flanges, which is always the way it's been. We used to have a beam years ago that had a steel reinforcing bar through the bottom of it. I'm not sure, Stefan, that's not available anymore, is it? I'm not, I'm not misspeaking and that, that's actually still no, available. Really I've forgotten. not available anymore. We, we still make it when we have to, but it's a very labor intensive and uh, expensive product. But maybe I can add, Tim, um, yeah. what you said, you know, typically we do like a GL17 can be manufactured in different grades using different MGP uh, grade laminates. So at, at the outers, there may be you know, 15 or higher graded, while on, uh, the, as inners, we would have an MGP-12 or possibly even an M MGP-10. So with the hard, using hardwoods uh, in combination with uh, softwoods, that, that's exactly the way it would be done. So eventually you want to achieve, let's say you're aiming for a GL-17, then you make up your recipe, depending on what you've got, outers and inners, and you combine them and cook them up in a beam. And one of the possibilities with timber is that you can, with the engineered wood products, you can make a recipe. So you can in, you can change the stiffnesses uh, and move the material that you want towards the outer edge. Uh, that's not possible in solids, just doesn't happen. You can't do it that way. But certainly with the built up beams, you can move material where you want it to be and where it's the most useful. So from an engineering perspective, the, the stronger material on the outside edges for a beam is always a, the priority. So gents, we've got a good question here from Dion Mukmula. Um, can you offer any insights into tie down methods for a timber portal frame to a slab or supporting structure? This one came up the other day. Tim, did uh, you? Yeah. Timber portal frames are new uh, and those connections will improve over time. So there will be abilities to do it. It's going to be site specific at this stage. The comment that I would make is that the benefit of a, of a portal frame over a narrow panel is that your tie downs for a portal frame are going to be much more manageable than a narrow panel style of um of tie down because the, yeah. the lever arm is just so much smaller and uh, i can add as well uh yeah it depends on uh, depends on whether the portal frame is designed as a fixed fixed support or or a pin mm -hmm. um, and and also it depends on whether whether the portal frame is going into a domestic application or commercial so if you take a domestic application the loads aren't aren't huge so you could easily but beside a tie down system by using the most conventional you know, concrete anchors, which might have an uplift of, of about 10 to 12 kilonewtons. Yeah. Or, or like the product that was shown by Stefan earlier in that example, uh, which has got, which has got a, a bit more stringent um, sort of tie, down, tie down solution and that uses a chemical anchor. So you could, you could get um, values up to about 30, 40 kilonewtons of tie down capability using using those chemical anchors. Yeah. It comes down to what we talked about before, sweet spots. Find the the, exactly, the, yeah. the the low hanging fruit, get people used to doing that before you ask them doing something difficult. I'm sure people will move to doing things more difficult over time, but let's not start them there because they won't go there. I mean that that's a good point that Tim makes that really sort of one of the things that generated um, this uh, webinar today was not just the fact that I'd been hearing this as part of my volume builder interviews, but also um, Bruce Wallace, who's a uh, frame and truss manufacturer, you guys would all know from uh, uh, from regional Victoria. He was making the point that, <clears throat> you know, uh, obviously when you're sort of dealing with just specific frame and truss commodity products, trusses and wall frames, you know, it's it's very competitive. There's not much margins in it. It's really quite difficult to, to make a dollar there sometimes, particularly if the market's uh, sort of not you know, running against you. But 
reality is that there's some real opportunity as frame and trust businesses to to you know come in and convert over these uh, steel beams to timber and you can make actually some decent bucks off it. I mean, Tim mentioned that before. Um, and and uh, some of the figures Bruce was sort of quoting in terms of how he shifted his business were really uh, amazing and you know, very dramatic. Um, but the important part about that also is at the end of the day, this is what the builder wants. Like he doesn't want to be going to multiple places to have to put the house together. If there's frame and trust manufacturers, you can be providing, as Tim and Stefan said, the uh, you know the one-stop solution. Then uh, <coughs> that's exactly what the builders are after. Afzal, um, you didn't get a bit of a chance to uh, uh, have a bit of a comment. Were there any other comments you'd like to make um, that weren't covered in the presentation today? I know you had done a lot of work with the costings before. Oh yeah, and I would just uh, you know want to sort of touch base on the bracing side of things. Um, I think. Um, most engineers are very quick to sort of go into a portal frame, a steel portal frame solution when, when they don't have much walls to work with. Um, so from a, from a fabricator perspective, you know, you've got options with um, using narrow, narrow sheet bracing panels or you can use a truss brace and so on. But, but they, don't, they don't often give you the capacity that you need in a, in a very open uh, like a, like a front facade with a large opening with very, very narrow wall. Um, so there are, there are solutions uh, which are available through the AWP companies um, with, with, so using timber portals. And they are often cheaper and much easier to work with on site. So I think if there are any engineers in the audience, I would encourage them to talk to us and talk to us timber engineers if, if, they, if they want, want to look at a timber portal solution. Um, just on that, and also on the on the other thing about the uh, uh, you know the best outcome that you can get is is the engineer specifying the timber at the at the outset because we don't want double handling in design. So I think if the fabricators can actually communicate with their builders and then pass on the advantages of timber, especially after after two days presentation, they can see all the benefits: one-stop solution, safer, lighter, all those things come on board. Uh, so if, if they can take that, take that knowledge base back to the builder, communicate it back to the engineer, get those timbers specified from that end. I think that will give us the more sustainable solution moving forward, um, rather than us trying to double handle and trying to redo the design. Because often you come, uh, come, come out of it with some, with some disadvantages. That way. And that's, well, that's one point I want to make. And also it gives the opportunity as well, because if you want to get a timber into the system, Sometimes you may, you could even potentially increase the flow depth because people generally work with a 240 to 300 flow depth, which is, which is fantastic for steel beams. But moment you go to a 360 flow depth, then you can get timber into the system, pretty much hidden away within the barrel. So that, that, that's, a, that's an advantage as well. So you can always look at it from a complete solution perspective rather than just designing the barrel on its own. So I think that's where that's where you can actually derive the benefits more. Um, and and one other note about the trusses as well. I think trusses trusses uh, do a great job when you have depth to work with. But also we have to keep in mind that trusses work well because they are they are by nature they are slender, so they work well if you can get some sort of lateral restraint. So in the two examples that were shown before, they, we were we had conveniently trusses coming on both sides and providing that restraint. So I think you have to make sure that when you're trying to bring in a truss solution, don't leave the top cord just flapping around without any restraint. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's, that's one, other, one other thing that I want to mention because often you tend to get too excited and put a truss in, but then you end up not having good restraints to work with. I was gonna make that point also, Afzal. I actually sort of really thought one of the most elegant uh, um, solutions that we were showing today with the case studies was that first one where, you know, those sort of four beams uh, or five steel beams that were sort of supporting that new structure above were actually replaced with trusses um, and fitted into the walls. I mean, that just looked like a really great opportunity for frame and truss people, just sort of smart ways of thinking about, uh, you know, using the things you do every day to replace steel that you don't use every day. And definitely with Bruce Wallace's um, the the person yeah the fabricator up in Bendigo, he he's he sold you know substantial amount of um, glue land beams and, and into that job. And as he said, it was it got to the point that he was removing one of the suppliers from the chain. So 
as Alistair's pointed out from his discussion with the top 100 builders, the builders are looking to reduce trades. So if you can provide it, and it's interesting that there's another fabricator that has actually gone the opposite where they've actually got a boiler maker and putting in steel beams, but it's still the same concept that they were providing that steel beam and they were also busy. So it's what builders were wanting. Um, obviously, we'd prefer people to go the timber option, um, but um, it, it, it does make a big difference in regards to what your value is that you're offering to the builder from a fabricator's point of view. That's a good point Kirsten makes. That was feedback that came from the builders as well. That I mean, there are going to be situations at times when you're going to have to use steel, but well, we know that. Uh, you, can't, you, you can't switch timber over for, for every bit of steel. But the comment they also made, as Kirsten pointed out, was actually if, if you can get a relationship with a steel fabricator where you're actually coming up with a solution for the builder, so the builder is not having to go to multiple people to get quotes and to get stuff done, it's being coordinated and delivered on site, that's certainly a benefit for them as well. I mean, look, uh, and I'll, as when I talk in my presentation in a couple of weeks' time, just about the segmentation we've done on builders, it's interesting to sort of note there are different type of builders out there. You know, some people want to control everything. Some people don't want to control anything. They want to pass the risk off to everyone else and sort of move even to full supply and install, which is a really interesting concept for the frame and truss sector we, we want to explore further. But um, yeah, definitely, if you can be making it easier for the builder, that's, uh, that's definitely something they're after. And clearly, they want to use timber instead of steel if they can. So uh, I really encourage you to look at this with your business. As Tim said, uh, use all the resources. You've got the, uh, you know, the technical teams in each of the nail plate manufacturing companies, which are fantastic. You've got lots of software in there you can use. And then for each of the different uh, companies supplying materials, um, such as such as Hein and Meyer and, uh, and others that aren't represented here today, all of those guys have got technical people that can help. So yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you want to make it easier for the builder and make bucks out of it for yourself. Find where you can really, you're not competing, you're actually finding a bit of a niche and you can really sort of pull some good some good dollars in. So does the group want to have any more points just before we finish up? We're just about on time now. Tim? Nope, no, all good. I'd reinforce Alistair's, uh, sorry, Apsol's um, comment about whole system design. Yeah. A lot of times the decisions are made too early that limit our abilities later down the process. So if, if we can get more things specified early, we'll find changes to the way in which buildings are structured to suit timber rather than us trying to jam timber in down the track. So whole building design is definitely a path that we need to push. Okay, fantastic. Well, look, uh, we're just about on time now. So that's great. I really want to thank uh, the speakers, Tim and Stefan, and then Afzal coming in at the end with the questions, but he did also help us prepare the presentation today, which was great. I remind you that um, there's some, uh, some terrific seminars coming up over September that Kirsten's got organised. So Wednesday the 9th, uh, one specifically on sales training. So make sure your salespeople tune into that. On um, Wednesday the 16th, uh, a webinar around tips to secure funding. That's got to be important. So the business owners and managers and HR people, that's focused on you. And then, um, on the, as I mentioned, on Wednesday the 23rd, I'll share some of the learnings from our top 100 volume builder interviews and an interesting segmentation we've approached, we've done around that to make it easier to, to target their needs. Um, can I just, uh, there is another question there from Mark Henniker of um, Holmes Glen saying, how about material characteristics, timber warps and steel expands creating torsion? Now we could have a whole now, sort of now the questions are starting up a whole half an hour of discussion just on that one, if you wanted to talk material characteristics and uh, different mm -hmm. steel. I don't know if any of the group wants to add to that, but look, it is all about just designing with the different materials you've got. I mean, they do all sort of uh, um, work differently. Um, timber's great, but we all know timber does some odd things now and again, you've got to deal with that, but the same thing with steel. Um, look, look, I wouldn't think... Um, steel expansion's too much of an issue, particularly with structural steel in residential building. It's not gonna get particularly hot unless the building's burning down. Um, but, um, and look, timber does move, but we, we're all sort of uh, happy to deal with that. But look, Mark, we can, we can handle any more of those questions offline if you'd like. Um, okay, thanks once again. Anything else, Kirsten, you wanna add? Um, I'm just gonna add on the um, 30th of September, we've just announced a new webinar and it's around um, how you can make a difference and stand up to domestic violence. So it's not about timber. But it's a very important social issue that for a male dominated industry, I think it's really important that um, we all tackle those social issues as an industry, as a sector, which shows, um, I suppose, how much we're involved with our employees and our communities. So that's on the 30th of September and that's being presented by Joe Mason, um, who used to work at Hine and specialises in domestic violence um, training. 
Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I really would like to thank um, Stefan, Avsel, Tim, and um, Alistair. You're just uh, absolute brilliant at this. So thank you very much, everybody. And um, visit the website to register for the September events. Thank you. Goodbye, Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Kirsten, bye.